So uh, today I wanted to talk to you about uh, knowing your presence, creative identity, and mental health. So I'm not going to go over my introduction. Um, April already did a fabulous job um, going over everything. Um, so let's just kind of skip into it. Um, so today I'm going to kind of talk about four main sections. One is about your story. Two is about your mental health. Three is your voice and four is about resources. So, before we get started, since we are going to uh, talk quite a bit about mental health, then it can be um, that topic in itself can be um, difficult for some and, and I just kind of want to ease everyone into this process. So, I want to do a quick breathing exercise. So, um, everyone at home in front of your screen, um, I just want everyone to just take a second, sit straight, to close your mouth and Exhale all of the breath out of your lungs. And then I'm going to count it out for a count of four. I want everyone to inhale slowly through your nose. So one, two, three, four. Then I want you to close the valve at the back of your throat and hold your breath once again for a count of four. One, two, three, Four, exhale slowly through your nose. One, two, three, four. And then if you want, you can hold your breath again after the exhale. And so uh, I, I wanna make sure that we're all centered. And next I wanna ask everyone um, an important question. Who am I and what does my story look like? So throughout this whole entire presentation, I want everyone to just kind of sit on this question, have it tucked away in the back of your head. Who am I and what does my story look like? So your story, the importance of your personal journey. Know first who you are and then adorn yourself accordingly by Epictetus. And I do apologize if I'm mispronouncing uh, his, his name. So know first who you are and then adorn yourself accordingly. So when we talk about ourselves, when we talk about our identities, it's important for us to kind of have a bigger scope of what our identities look like. They intersect all the time with each other. And so here's a, a little example layout of just some intersecting identities that most of us have. Gender, sexuality, disability, education, class, race. Um, for some people, what's an important aspect of their identity um, that might not be on here um, could be age. Um, it could be any defining part of yourself that you feel um, has given you privileges in your life, or you feel like you might have been discriminated against somewhere in your life. And so, you know, it's, it's, I'm gonna delve into why this is important. When I look at myself, I see myself in a very different light than other people see me. When I typically enter a room, the order in which people see me, tend to fall in line with kind of the obvious. People see that I'm a black female, so there's the race and gender. Because of my gender, people typically assume what my sexuality is. They typically assume that I'm straight. And so that is typically number three of the order of how people uh, interact with me and how they see me. And then it usually follows by class, which also goes into education and disability. Um, for me, that is completely inaccurate. Um, although I am a black female, um, this is actually the order of which, you know, how I see myself when I enter a room. My disability to me and my race, both are at the top of the list. Um, these are 
just a drop of my disabilities. I have a few more. Um, and I grew up and I, I acquired, um, I grew up and was raised with, uh, with a, a number of disabilities um, that I have either grown out of or transitioned out of. And so in this point in my life right now, my main disabilities is our major depressive disorder, MDD, anxiety disorder, and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, when I was growing up, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, um, I grew up in Dallas, Texas, um, born and raised, um, grew up in 1989. When I was born, uh, all of my disabilities were incredibly apparent. Um, I had um, a lot of difficulty with my speech, with my um, walking. I had um, I had uh, quite a few learning disabilities and it all made it, um, it very difficult for me when I was younger, just going through the school system with how people treated me. Um, it was one of the biggest things that when I was younger and to this point now as an adult has been uh, one of the constants for sure in my life that I've constantly fought for um, and that hold a lot of importance for me. Um, once again, and in large part because people treated me very differently um, when I was younger, and 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 you know that that didn't get lost on me. Same with my race. You know, being a black woman uh, growing up in Texas, I uh, definitely got treated a certain way, especially when um, people did assume and guess what my disabilities were. There were a lot of discrimination um, and stigmas that were thrown at me. So the two things about these identities about myself that are, I think, especially important to me is that um, with my disability and growing up in 1989, in 1990, that's when the American Disabilities Act um, got passed into law. Um, so that really gave new ground for people who looked like me and who had disabilities like me to really have a voice in the education and public system um, and uh, in a vastly different way. Um, I am one of the first generations to really take a hold of this law. Um, and that also kind of bumpers next to, um, at the time growing up in Texas, the school systems, uh, there, uh, up until it, up until what was about 2004, it was, um, the court finally declared the Dallas public school system as desegregated. But when I was going uh, through the school system, there were uh, quite a lot of desegregation acts that were put into play to uh, to try to go against some of the more uh, racist rhetoric that kept people like me out of some of the um, nicer schools and uh, within the system. And so these two laws, the ADA law and this desegregation act, um, really paved and defined this big part of my life um, and it gave, and allowed me access in different ways. So even though um, I got privileges from those laws and from some of uh, what came from those laws, um, I encountered a lot of discrimination at the same time, just trying to kind of fight for my voice and get to um, basically where I'm at now. As you see, the order of my other identities follow as gender. I'm female. Um, I, I identify as female. I was born female. Um, my education, I'm college educated in my class. I'm uh, recently middle class. Um, and then the last identity, which is only last because I've never, I've been privileged enough where I've never had to face any type of backlash. Um, you know, my sexuality, I'm heterosexual. Everyone's order of their identity look completely different. You know, everyone's order looks so completely different. And it's important that when we look at our identities, when we look at ourselves, that we also understand how other people might be faring or dealing in our society um, because their order does look different. You know, someone who just like how I grew up um, 
with this whole entire backstory and all these struggles with my disability and race. There are so many other people out there who've also experienced similar discrimination because of their gender, because of their class, or because of their sexuality. And so that it are the top you know, three of their identities that hold dear to them for a lot of different reasons. Um, and so it's just important that we all kind of be aware of this, um, especially when we think about what our story actually is. So question for everybody who's looking at this. Um, what is your intersexuality uh, order? Where does your order lie? You know, and and why is that order important to you? That that why is it important that you want to be seen in a way that might be different than how other people see you? Um, so as we think about that question, I want to move on to the section two, mental health. And just checking the time here, make sure that I'm on track. Okay, number two, your mental health, the importance of self advocacy. The seeker always finds what he seeks simply because of constant attention and perseverance by anonymous. So, as I talked about and shared with you guys about my whole entire history with my disability and with my mental health, um, I have learned um, over the past few years that when we are talking about disability, when we're talking about our identities, it, it doesn't necessarily matter if you identify as having mental health concerns or not. It is important for everyone to take care of themselves and to have some sort of idea of how they can best treat themselves and what their personal uh, mental health toolkit looks like. Because your mental health is just so drastically important. As you know, when we're talking about the order of our identities and our stories, different things about that order of your of your identities, of what your personal truth is, there are different things about that that can be uncomfortable. There are different things about that that can be liberating. Um, and I think, you know, especially when it gets to the uncomfortable part where you are feeling um, a particular way um, that is that you might not classify as positive, that you have a strategy on how you can best advocate for yourself. Um, and so this is one of my favorite slides on here. Uh, so I'm going to run through these real fast. Um, there is uh, four different sections that I put up here. So one is therapy uh, and there's a bunch of different types of therapy. This is only a drop in a bucket of the different type of therapies that are out there. Um, definitely if you're seeing what's on here for any of these lists and they don't quite fit you, don't worry. There's tons out there. You know, this is the magic of being able to customize your mental health toolkit. You get to kind of pick and choose what's working best for you and put in your back pocket. So when you need to draw on it, you already have a list available for you. So these are just a few examples. So there's uh, with therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. CBT. Um, it's very uh, common therapy, uh, very popular. Um, it's um, some people use it for more short term um, kind of sessions or therapy use. Then there's psychodynamic therapy, um, that, which is typically for longer use. Um, aromatherapy, which uh, if anyone has uh, ever seen those essential oils, uh, they come in tons of different scents. Um, there's actually a science behind how some of those scents um, hit our nose, and there's a bunch of different ways that you can combine them uh, to help with, um, for instance, if you're um, feeling uh, particularly depressive, there's a different sense that you can use with aromatherapy it, uh, with other things within your toolkit that could be helpful. I know for myself personally, um, I kind of have a, a 
pick and choose kind of list of what's everything um, that is here. You know, I go to therapy, proud of it. I believe everyone should go to therapy. Um, I also um, use aromatherapy. Um, I also uh, use art therapy, which is amazing. It's a way to creatively kind of uh, check in with yourself and express your emotions. Then there's, uh, there's also a bunch of different types of medicines that are out there. There's a pre prescribed medicine you can get from going to your doctor, going to your therapist. Um, a lot of these you guys might know about, like antidepressants and mood stabilizers. Um, always, you know, my kind of rule of thumb that I have and that, you know, I'd like to tell everybody is um, do your research. You know, if um, if you are going to a doctor and you think that you might need medication or if you're not sure if you need medication that is being suggested to you, research it, you know, really check in with your with yourself um, because really understanding, you know, how your Feeling or how your body might react uh, with certain um, medications or therapies or whatever it is, um, it, it's just important. So do your research, keep checking in with yourself, make sure that it's a good fit for you. Um, same with your therapist, tons of different therapists out there and sometimes it can be overwhelming on where to even look. Um, and, you know, it's, and it is a process. Um, if you go to a therapist, if you are taking medication, whatever it is, and you're not reacting well to it, or if you have your concerns about it, don't blow them off. You know, you are important um, and you're just pay attention to, to those first thoughts. Talk to your doctor, um, look at other options for therapists if that's you know needed, but just do your research and just check in with yourself to make sure that you're going about your mental health and setting up your mental health toolkit in the best way possible. Um, and so quickly, some other medications, there's alternative medicines. Um, so there's vitamins, um, there's medical marijuana. Um, you know, once again, with whatever you're putting in your body, especially if it's for mental health, do your research, just know how um, it is treating and, and how it might impact you and your health and your mental health. Um, so just do your research, talk to a doctor, make sure that you have the best information before you, um, you know, dive um, head first into anything. And then quickly, there are a few other um, little toolkit gems that you can pick. With creative outlets, they're, is always the arts. The arts, um, I grew up in the arts when I, before I mentioned, um, I grew up with a lot of speech um, issues uh, for about seven, eight years of my life growing up. I couldn't really speak in a way that other people could actually understand. Um, tons of speech therapy, and that actually was the outlet for me of how I got into the arts. Um, I found that being able to create my world and being able to express myself in an alternative way um, where people could still interact with me, can still understand um, what I was trying to say, uh, it meant the world to me. And for people, you know, that looks, the arts um, is, Huge, just random. I'm going to go into some of the different creative outlets a little bit later, but always keep the arts in the back of your mind if you're feeling particularly frustrated because it is an amazing outlet. Um, journaling, if you have a diary, if even if you're online and you're just, you know, need to post stuff. However, journaling is working for you. Um, where you're able to confidently get out what you need to express um, and where you feel like it's protected, um, do that. Journaling helps if keeping things in for a long time, I know can be very frustrating. Um, in my mind never sleeps. I wake up hitting the ground running. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to step outside of that, you know, especially if you are an overthinker or someone who does get overwhelmed easily or someone with a lot of anxiety, which is like me. So journaling helps. Volunteering also helps. 
Um, I, when I was in college, I, a friend of mine, my best friend, um, unexpectedly passed away and it kickstarted a lot of things for me dealing with that sudden loss. Um, and at the time I did not really have an idea of what my mental health even looked like. I didn't have the vocabulary for it. Um, and so there was just a lot of fresh ground with a lot of grief and a lot of frustration. And I'm still trying to, you know, keep my scholarship so I can stay in school. And so it's a bunch of just compacting emotions coming in at once. And um, as counterproductive as you might think it might sound, uh, volunteering really helped me get through that grief. Um, that I needed to go through um, because of my, my friend's passing. I started volunteering at an uh, organization that assisted people who were blind and visually impaired. And that honestly also kickstarted my kind of love on another level for the disabled community. It really allowed me to see how I can produce this negative feeling energy and really turn it into something that is going to benefit someone else on such a genuine level. And there was also this other kind of layer to it too, where, you know, I was feeling miserable most of the time back then and I'll be crying and everything else. Um, and going into this office where I didn't necessarily have to worry about being seen, so to say, you know, um, with the tears, I felt amazing. It felt like I could still function, I could still cry, show up someplace, puffy face. Um, no one really asked me about it and I can just kind of keep doing what I needed to do to get over and get through all those negative feelings I was feeling. So long story short, volunteering. Um, meditation is always a big one. Uh, yoga, if it's the breathing exercises that we did at the beginning, that is that can be part of a meditation. Anytime that you're feeling pent up, overwhelmed, uh, and overwhelmed, you can meditate. It doesn't need to be a 10, 15 minute over, you know, big thing where you need all the space to yourself. You can meditate and quiet and by yourself wherever you are. You just need to know, you know, different techniques um, and then exercise. Of course, any type of movement um, really helps get your mind just kind of oh, it just opens up your mind and, and it gets I, I it just really helps you set different goals. And then lastly, um, we have support system. Know who your support system is when you are feeling in the dumps, when you're at the bottom of your personal black hole knowing who you can turn to is huge. And sometimes um, when we're already at that point, when we're already down that hole, it feels really difficult to figure out who's on our side or what even um, our mental health toolkit can possibly look like, which is why it's important to think about all of this and put it together before you, know, you have to go through something, you know, potentially, you know, um, depressive where you need this, but you don't have it. So support system, daily self check-ins might sound weird, but when you wake up in the morning, just asking yourself out loud, how am I feeling? If for whatever reason you're feeling negative, you're feeling upset, simply asking yourself, why am I feeling this? It sounds so incredibly simple, but it does wonders with you not only understanding yourself and communicating with yourself about your emotions, but it kind of helps you take a step back and, and look at, for me at least, look at the next steps of what I need to do in order to feel better. So you have to acknowledge it first, do the daily self check-ins. There are tons of support groups. If um, with as many concerns and issues there are in the, this world, there are just that many support groups. Um, never feel like you're, you are alone or that your experience is out of reach for people. 
Um, there are, I promise you, there are always people there who um, are willing and ready to talk to you and to um, be on your side and work with you. If you have family and friends in particular that you always, you know, call to, that you always go to when things start getting bad, keep them in your support system. Note, take, note who those people are. Of course, we got your school counselor, your health center, you know, um, always, always look into that. Harper has a wonderful um, center. Look into the resources there. Um, you know, sometimes the best advice you can get is within arm's length away. So never discount the school and the resources that they can provide. And then lastly, religious practice. If you do um, practice um, a religion um, and if you find comfort in that, once again, note take that. If you're finding support and a ritual or prayer, note take that. Know, know the more you know about yourself and why things are positively affecting you, um, the better. Which leads me to my next slide, mood, triggers, and signs. So I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen this before. And before you discount how simple it is, um, you know, the list of moods and everything, just bear with me. Uh, when I first started going through to therapy years ago, one of the first things my therapist gave me was actually um, a chart. It didn't look this pretty and cute, but it was a chart of a bunch of different emotions. Um, and she had me go through the list and pick out emotions that I could connect with. Um, that I had connect with and that I already knew. And it was pretty um, interesting and inferior and infuriating because at that time I was dealing with, um, I was dealing with bucket loads of depression. I was just in a horrible place. And after looking at this list, I realized that I knew anxiety and I knew everything else that came with anxiety really well. I knew what it felt like to be overwhelmed, to be fearful, to overthink. And, you know, anxiety and depression, they're kind of like cousins. So dealing with my depression, I also was able to, through this list, being uh, able to kind of visualize and kind of see a little bit deeper with my depression that there was kind of a pattern of what I was feeling too. I would feel miserable, inadequate, lonely. And, to be honest, seeing this list, there were a bunch of things I started to zero in on that I wish that I could feel, so to say, you know, like joy. Um, and so it became kind of like a mission, like having a kind of a baseline understanding of just what basic emotions were and how they broke down and how I could actually apply them to myself made me realize what emotions that I just straight up was not feeling, which led me to problem solve on how can I get around to feeling these emotions? You know, I have my mental health checklist, I'm doing all this other stuff, but what else can I do to help kind of trigger that excitement and that euphoria? And once again, I looked at my own patterns. So these are just some examples. But I noticed that, for instance, I would get excited when I would go to the art museum and have road trips with friends. And one of the signs that I was excited was that I would talk about the future more. I was optimistic. I, I felt a lightness. And then I also realized that what are triggers and signs for the good can play out, you know, I can still take that logic to some of the more depressive moods. When I mentioned um, my friend who had passed, so when I was feeling depressed, one of the triggers, passing of a loved one, I started self-isolating a whole lot more. And one of the signs that started to kind of tie everything together that there might be a bigger issue was that I was neglecting self-care. 
you know, and to be honest, that self care was easily overlooked, I think, from afar. Um, when people neglect self care, it can come in different formats, right? You can stop eating, you might overeat, you might sleep more, you might sleep less. Um, if it's in excess and out of the ordinary, then how you typically, you know, kind of would handle a situation, um, you know, it's, it's good to know what that looks like. Um, and so, once again, um, just give you an overall idea, you know, this is kind of the train of thought that I was able to follow to figure out what worked for me, what caused those positive triggers, negative triggers, and what the signs were. So, dealing with self-care is not always easy. Um, I think almost everyone who's listening to this probably knows that to some extent there's a lot of stigmas that come with taking care of ourselves, which in itself is insane because taking care of yourself is one of the best things that you can possibly do. And, you know, there are just two perfect truths in this world. And one is your self care is important. It, it just is, it's a baseline, it's important. And the second, you know, truth is there is no shame with addressing what you need. And so these are just some of the stigmas that I'm sure some of us have heard either direct to us or we have heard, you know, in passing somewhere else. So I'm just going to read a few of them. If you have a disability, you can't. You can't work. You can't do this. You can't do that. It's all bunkus. Having a mental health concern means you're crazy. No, not seeking proper health for yourself when you need it. That's crazy. Having a mental health concern, there's nothing crazy about that. People like us don't go to therapy. Um, you know, I, I think especially if you're a minority, you probably hear this a lot. You know, I know that for myself growing up, you know, within the black community there, especially when I was growing up and especially now, there's always been this hesitancy or this, this stigma about, um, I guess black, about us being able to to not only access therapy, but what that actually means for us when we do have therapy. Um, so people like us don't go to therapy. I don't deserve help because um, you can come up with a lot of excuses for why you deserve to be mistreated or why you think you deserve to be mistreated. Um, and that once again goes to our self care. It's very easy sometimes, especially when you're at a point in your life to kind of feel a hopelessness and to feel like there is that you are undeserving or that you are going to be a bother. Once again, I, it's hard to remind yourself when you're already feeling so, so negatively, but um, you do deserve help. You deserve all the help and love. There is just like everyone in this world. Um, taking medication means I'm weak. A lot of people have their own ideas of what you know it looks like if you take medication, if you don't take medication, what that might mean about you as a person or your character. And and taking medication does not mean you're weak. You know, it, it if you need it and it's helping you, that is perfect. And if you don't need it then that's perfect too, you know? It, it's not a competition, one's not better than the other. Once again, check in with yourself, and if you're finding that medication's helping you, then it's helping you. You don't need to explain yourself to anyone. Um, so moving on, uh, COVID mental health. We're going into a year of being locked in and working from home and, everything else and things have been particularly stressed, uh, particularly for yourself, students. Um, I'm just gonna quickly read these, um, just so you understand to the importance of why we're even talking about this today and why this is such a big concern overall. You know, students most at risk of mental health challenges stemming from the pandemic include women, Students under age 25, students of Asian descent, those in poor health, 
those who knew somebody with COVID-19 and lower income students. Going back to what we talked about before with our identities and how they intersect, you know, how many identities did we just pull up in just this one list? And we're talking about a pandemic that, yes, is affecting everybody, but is affecting everybody on different levels. Um, so don't discount yourself if you feel like over this past year has been particularly tough and things you have been where you think you do need mental health. Um, don't discredit what you're feeling. Um, just recognize it. Um, some other studies have come out. Um, the pandemic has also um, disproportionately affected the health of communities of color. Um, the American Council on Education um, from last year report that 53% of college presidents listed student mental health um, among their biggest COVID-19 related worries. Once again, you students have not had it easy. A lot has happened within just a year alone and outside of just school, you know, frustration, and anxiety, which has always been there. There's just all these other compounding factors and fears and anxieties. And for a lot of people, this is your first time dealing with some of some of these things. Um, so it's important. I'm, I'm just going to keep beating a dead horse. It's important that you um, understand your own mental health and how to best advocate for for yourself because you've been through a lot, you know, you've been through a lot and you deserve the care and the love that you need because you've been through a lot. Um, and then once again, to drive home, you know, this even more, uh, the CDC reported that one in four people aged between 18 and 24 has seriously considered suicide in the last 30 days. So, you know, there is so much pain and grief and thought that can lead somebody to this point or that point. And there's so many options and so many outlets available to us to help bumper us from that option. I know that sometimes it does feel like it is the best thing, you know, option for you, especially when you're feeling particularly depressed. But once again, you do have options. You do have the love out there for you. And, you know, the more that you can just kind of build up your own kind of self care and mental health um, toolkit, going back to that, then I'm not going to say it's going to take away all the pain that you might be feeling, but it can definitely help take away some of that pain um, and address it in different ways. So here are some toolkit additions, some uh, quick ones that I've used that definitely help. Um, positive affirmations, keep positive affirmations around your home for encouragement. Um, they don't have to be anything big or grand, like live, laugh, love, or anything painted on your wall. But, you know, if you found some clippings in a magazine that you like, or if a postcard that you have, or a magnet, any, anything that when you look at it, it reminds you uh, and grounds you, uh, put it up, you know? No one has to know why it's up there, except for you. Creating an SOS system. Um, if you have someone that you're particularly close with, you know, this is a pretty cool system about having to say much, just text SOS to them. Of course, talk to them beforehand about why you're doing it, set up, you know, the rules about it, but it can be as indicator that when you receive SOS from this person that you need to call them within 15 minutes or they're having maybe a mental health crisis and they need to talk to you. Um, so there's definitely discrete ways that you can talk about your mental health concerns and share those mental health concerns with other people, um, especially if in the moment you are having that mental health concern. Um, and then once again, like I was saying before, personal patterns. How do you know when you reach your mental limit? How can you tell and who do you reach for help? Understanding how that works within yourself gives you just a lot of information of how you can move forward. 
So what does your mental health toolkit look like? So number three, your voice, the importance of self-expression. There is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you by Maya Angelou. So we talked about creative expression and I'm not gonna go too deep into this because we are starting to run uh, on the end of time, but these are just some of the creative outlets that are available to everyone. Music, singing, dancing, theater, art, baking, cooking, writing. Can you think of any other creative expression, creative outlets that you partake in that you just really enjoy? Because um, let me tell you, there are a lot of benefits of just delving into these creative outlets. Um, it relieves stress and encourages brain activity, help boost self-esteem and encourage creative thinking. It is in a lot of ways therapy in itself. And then on that note, just the benefits of sharing um, experiences goes deep and it runs long. It assists, you're assisting others. It reveals your story can help you find your own voice. It fortifies using your story can reaffirm personal values and it heals living your truth because of your story and help find inner peace and hope. So um, I am founder and director of Sport, this wonderful nonprofit in Chicago. And so this is pretty much our bread and butter. This is what um, we do. We love talking to different people within the community um, and giving them a platform where they can share their lived experiences. And as we talk about with identities, those lived experiences are broad. So um, currently we have um, over 160 originally written pieces of work and video interviews um, submitted by over 50 uh, writers and creatives. Um, so one of the special things about us as well is that um, a large part of our writers and volunteers that come to us are new to their disability. Um, they're either new to the community, they either they just acquired their disability. So there is um, a lot of times a lot of new ground that they're trying to figure out for themselves. So we try to make this whole writing process really easy. Um, you don't need any writing experience at all to submit work if it's coming from your heart and your mind and it's landing on paper and it is your story and your truth and you want the world to see it then you work with that why wouldn't we it's coming from you um uh there's free one-on-one -on -one writing support and we also do mental health check-ins and we have a big resource library so we try to fortify our um volunteers um and creatives as much as we can um, writers obtain full creative license and control of their submitted work, um, which is important because maybe one year you wrote something very deep about, it could be whatever, it could be how you were feeling about your own disability, um, but then the next year you changed your mind or you want to take that story and change it to another format. We don't own your work, it is all yours. So you can have complete creative control and license. Um, you can also use an alias if using your own name is something that makes you uncomfortable. Um, we have a lot of people that use um, aliases and I think that, you know, there's, I, I use an alias for some of my stories on here. Um, so please, you know, if you, there's something, there's a story inside of you and you're afraid of when that story is out, how, um, because it's, a, it's controversial, whatever it is, how it might affect you, especially um, your work, because that is a big issue that does come up. People want to talk about their truths, but they don't want their employer to find out because um, they don't want the, all the stigmas to come with it. We have an alias, we keep it under wraps. All content is accessible. We work with a bunch of professional um, audio um, narrators to um, help bring the story to life and also helps make it um, more accessible for those with um, vision and cognitive concerns. So since we are running short on time, I'm just going to play uh, one sample um, of, um, from our library. Um, and, you know, I think I'll go with Purdue, um, Yuri Smith. Let me see if it will. Play. Purdue. 
30. by Yuri a Spork exclusive article narrated by Catherine Jordan. Trigger and content warning, themes of suicide and ableist language. It's been two months since I was deinstitutionalized from a psychiatric ward. Many things have changed since then. I lost my best friend, started several projects regarding disability advocacy, have gone to multiple support groups, and am taking different medications to alleviate severe insomnia, anxiety, and depression every day. After being discharged, I have experienced extreme feelings of isolation, insecurity, and hopelessness. During the process, I broke up with one of my friends whom I trusted the most, but at the same time, who called police during the crisis. Our last conversation was very traumatic. I criticized them that they defined the hierarchy between rational and irrational by reporting me to police and that they didn't try to accommodate my disabilities. In contrast, my friend retorted that I was the one who acted irrationally and inconsistently, which made me lose any accountability or credibility before calling out injustice. Also, they said it was not their job to support me. After the conversation, I sensed a deep crevasse between our different understandings on mental health, identities, and systems. This is unavoidable since we experience and undergo different realities. But I wondered whether it is possible to find alternative strategies in those situations and restore disconnection. For this article, I wanted to share part of my story. So, um, of course, if you go to Spork's website, you can uh, read and hear the full story. Um, Yuri Kim, um, she's an amazing writer. She um, actually was writing about her experience, I believe, when she was still in college. Um, and uh, and all um, everything else that's listed on here is also within our audio um, library on Spork's website. Um, if you want to hear a little bit more about this, oh, and I see that we have ten minutes left. Um, so just real fast, um, what does your personal story look and sound like? Um, we talked about your identities. We talked about these mental health toolkits, and we're wrapping it up and putting it together and about this bigger story. So, if you had to write your story, what does it look and sound like? So, we're going to quickly get into some resources before we go into Q and A. So, uh, I am seeking, I am striving, I am in it with all my heart by Vincent Van Gogh. So a list of a um, few uh, great organizations within the Chicago area um, that are within your reach at all times. Uh, of course, the Harper College Access and Disability Services, SPORC, um, a nonprofit, Telling Tales Theater. They um, help work with you in your story and help uh, create uh, uh, performances. Um, Really amazing. Um, and a few online tools, um, Psychology Today to help you find a therapist, San Velo Health app, which was um, designed and put together by a bunch of uh, coaches and therapists. So once again, if finances, uh, if you feel like finances ever gets in the way between you being able to find uh, a therapist or to seek help, there are always a bunch of options out there. Um, and same if you find a therapist that you like, but you don't know if they take your insurance, ask if they uh, do a sliding fee scale, and you might be able to, you might be surprised about um, how, how uh, cheap it is to be able to, to, to find a therapist that you like. A few other um, resources, a few hotlines. Um, the American Disabilities Act Information Assistance Hotline, if you ever need help about um, just uh, disability accommodations, you know, as a student at school, go to them, they can answer your questions. Uh, National Suicide Prevention Hotline, um, and if you live in Illinois, there's a call for calm program uh, where you can text them and you can still um, speak to a mental health care professional. Volunteer match if you're trying to find volunteer opportunities in your area, and then a TheraBox, which is a self care subscription box. Um, I believe it's $39.99 um, for uh, per month, and uh, it's curated with a bunch of goodies and wellness aids. So if you literally need help creating your mental health toolkit, TheraBox can help you with that. So if you uh, take home exercises for you, once again, reflect. Who am I and what does my story look like? Use any creative outlet and tell a part of your story. 
and completely optional. But if you want to share your story, I'm always here. Spork is always here for you. You can use aliases. All media types are accepted. You know, uh, take my uh, my email information um, and please contact me. Here are some of my personal examples of um, of um, mental health toolkits. My personal journey board that's in my kitchen, my list of affirmation that's in my uh, bathroom cabinet, all my journals, and then a big art piece that I'm working on. You know, I practice what I preach. This stuff really does help. Know your toolkit, put together a toolkit that helps for you, um, and just really check in with yourself about your mental health. Thank you. Um, this is my email. Please feel free to email me. Um, and yeah, I'm open to um, any questions.